First and foremost, I want to validate your feelings here. The Book of Mormon can be rather boring. There, I said it. At least in some parts. Now, I personally think that Peter Jackson would really enjoy the war chapters from the Book of Alma, but that's beside the point. The Book of Mormon can absolutely be considered boring to the modern reader for two particular reasons. First, as you astutely pointed out, the archaic language of the Book of Mormon is awkward and dated. It uses a whole lot of phrases like slew many of them, set at naught, exceedingly strong, precious ore, a great multitude gathered, spirits of men, by the cunning, abide upon, ought of, thou shouldst, thus ended the, and thus they were, a numerous people, prevail upon, against the breastwork, press forward, and need not fear. All these phrases come off as awkward to the modern reader and can feel burdensome when engaging with the text because it can be a barrier between the author and the reader. And it's natural to feel frustration with that. However, I'm gonna push back a little on your assertion that this is what makes the Book of Mormon boring and Tolkien's writing fascinating because every one of the phrases that I just listed out are identical matches found in both the Book of Mormon and Tolkien's Middle-earth legendarium. Fancy that. And I'm gonna put on my critic's hat for a little bit. Well, that's because every one of these phrases just comes from the Bible. Both Joseph and Tolkien are just copying phrases from the KJV. And to that I would say, Actually, they're not. Every one of these phrases are exact matches found in the Book of Mormon and Tolkien's Book of Westmarch, but none of them are found in the King James Bible. Though I will concede that for some of them, a slight variance may match up with the KJV. And that should be expected because all three literary works are rendering a translation in archaic English. If we were to include KJV matches, we'd find even more examples, such as in the ancient days, great waters, great wickedness, the remnant of the house of, remnant of the people, children of men, fled before them, the devices of, they would not forsake the, and hallowed it, haste thee upon the face of the earth, hither and thither, well nigh, dominion over all the, in the pride of his heart, some few, and he prophesied, waste places, in the midst of the land, hewn stones, in captivity, on the fifth day, foundations of the earth, and dwelt in the land. All of these are found in Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon, Tolkien's Book of Westmarch, and the King James Bible, but strictly the Old Testament. And the vast majority of these phrases are rarely used, appearing only two or three times in the entire Bible. We would have to believe that Joseph, a 19th century modern English speaker, is diving into Second Chronicles just to pluck out the one instance of in captivity, or well nigh, or some few, or hewn stones. It's not likely. To be clear, the Book of Mormon is using 19th century idioms and language, but it's largely presenting them through the lens of King James English. And this happens to be exactly what Tolkien does in his works, and it's intentional. Tolkien specifically calls this approach moderated or watered archaism. It's a fascinating literary choice. And there's even more seemingly rarely used phrases that are found throughout the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and Tolkien's works, such as durst not, a strange land, bade them, from that time forth, the chief city, murmured against, and fallen to the earth. Each of these is only used a handful of times in the entire Bible, but it's also in Joseph's and Tolkien's works. And of course, I saved this last one for you, and it came to pass, which turns out to also be used in Tolkien's works. As you can see, just a small sample right here. In fact, Tolkien's use of it came to pass is so notable that there are literally memes on Reddit about this. Here are just a few so you know that I'm not making this up. What's interesting is Tolkien's reason for having embedded archaic English in his writing. There's very little of it in The Hobbit. It's increasingly more pervasive across The Lord of the Rings, and it becomes the dominant mode of writing in The Silmarillion. Why is that? After all, Tolkien spent a tremendous amount of time laboring over not just the stories, but every single word in his account. He focused specifically on each and every word that he used. It turns out that Tolkien made the decision to select linguistic registers to suit different peoples and their accounts. This is why the translation renders easy in modern English for hobbits, a very simple people, and more archaic English for the accounts of the dwarves, elves, and the Rohirrim. This is most evident at the Council of Elrond in the Fellowship of the Ring, where we see elves, dwarves, and hobbits conversing with one another. In Tolkien's mind, this made the element of it being a rendered English translation of an ancient text feel more real to the reader. If you want to learn more about this, read Tolkien's letter number 171 on this topic. And again, Tolkien was uniquely equipped to write at length in archaic English because Tolkien was an old English Anglo-Saxon professor at the time of composing these literary works. This was his profession. So honestly, I hear you, brother. The archaic English is not for the faint of heart. It's completely reasonable to feel frustrated by that. But based on your comment right here, I don't think you're being entirely objective about your assessment of these two texts. While we're on the topic, I think critics of the Book of Mormon tend to drive between two separate lanes. Joseph is a blockhead who can hardly string two thoughts together without using the phrase, and it came to pass every 15 words, as a filler because he's simply making it up as he goes along. Or this is yet another literary detail that Joseph, 
like Tolkien, carefully crafted this narrative and intentionally embedded this into the text to offer a sense that we're in reality reading an awkwardly rendered English translation. Considering the fact that the dominant critical narrative heavily relies on Joseph having supernatural and captivating storytelling abilities, which is how we explain how Joseph was capable of authoring the Book of Mormon, I recommend subscribing to the latter, but you have to pick a lane. And here's what I find interesting about Joseph's excessive use of And It Came to Pass, because it is excessive. The Hebrew word that renders and it came to pass is this one. I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not even gonna try. Experienced translators of the Hebrew Bible came across this phrase hundreds of times. And rather than rendering and it came to pass in every instance, they render slight variations such as and it happened, and thus became, and so it was, or simply thus, and, or when. But Joseph's purported translation repeatedly renders and it came to pass, especially in the narrative chapters, but almost completely absent within the more literary parts and poetic passages, such as Psalms, speech, and epistles. In my personal opinion, this adds to Joseph's purported facade. It is an ancient text translation rendered by an amateur translator such as Joseph, because any experienced translator such as J.R.R. Tolkien would have the sense to render a variance of this translation so as not to use this phrase so excessively. It's fascinating. The second reason of what makes the Book of Mormon so boring is what Mark Twain called chloroform in print, but I'll cover that in another video.